You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Well, hi everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Examined Life with Phil. This is the first one I've done in probably almost a month and a half now, and my apologies for that. Family life with uh, my two kids being home all the time, and my wife and I having to deal with many other family-related things just to kind of got the better of me, and I wasn't able to get to podcast for uh, that long, even though I said I'd scale them back to only every two weeks, so my uh, my apologies for that. There's no excuse other than that it's just on me, so again, my apologies. I'm going to continue to do my best going forward to continue to get them out to you every two weeks, and I think at this point, if uh, I get up early and my kids are still making too much noise for me to record something... I'm just going to take the mic and my computer and go out to one of the cars and shut the doors and record it in there because it seems like that's about what I'm going to have to do at this point. Right now, everybody else is sleeping and I'm locked in an office with the door shut, but cross your fingers because there's a pretty good chance somebody's going to wake up and need something in a few minutes here. We'll, we'll see. But anyhow, again, my apologies for that. And this week, what I want to do is talk about distinctions and definitions. And as I've thought about doing this episode, I've had notes on it for the past couple of weeks, but as I said, wasn't really able to get to it. Well, I realized that this is probably something that I should have done as like one of the very, very first episodes, because distinctions and definitions are essentially something like, uh, not something like, but they're one of the very foundations of how you go about thinking well, is how do you make distinctions and how do you define things? And um, in that same vein, how do you categorize things? If you can get those right, you're probably not going to have very many problems with your thinking. And so that's what I want to do a whole podcast episode on here is distinctions, definitions, and to a lesser but similar degree, how do you categorize things? How, do, how you categorize things is actually a, sometimes a much more difficult question than drawing distinctions and how you define things. Even though at times it can be little tricky as to where you draw a distinction and where you define things, but I'm not going to try and talk about the edge wedge issues where it's difficult. I'm going to talk about the easy to recognize things. So part of what got me thinking about this is a couple weeks back when I started doing uh, notes for this, I read an old tweet from the actor Rain Wilson. He played Dwight on The Office. He's best known for that. He's done some other stuff, too. I always thought he was very, very funny as Dwight on uh, The Office, and some of the other stuff he did was all right. I, I don't know. He, he seems to have done really, really well as Dwight, and... Uh, just okay, in my opinion, in other things. But hey, if you like his other stuff, that's fine too. Anyhow, he tries to be a bit uh, philosophically astute. My understanding is he follows the Bahrain faith. A few years back, I asked some people in my family to get me philosophy books, and one of them bought me a book that he'd actually written that was supposed to be on philosophy called Soul Pancake. Now, I actually don't recommend reading the book. It was uh, no offense to the family member who bought it to me, because she couldn't have known this. But it was actually very, very dumb. It was a very, very superficial. It was kind of like, it, if you were in high school, did you ever meet the guy who smoked a lot of weed and thought he had the greatest philosophical insights ever, but it was all very, very superficial and stupid? That was kind of this book. Although I don't know if Rain Wilson does weed or drugs or whatever, but anyhow, that's what this book was like. So anyhow, he put out a tweet, and this is kind of old, although I only found it a couple of weeks ago. I think it's from August 3rd, 2019. And he says, The metamorphosis of Jesus Christ from a humble servant of abject poor to a symbol that stands for gun rights, prosperity theology, anti-science, limited government that neglects the destitute, and fierce nationalism is truly the strangest transformation in human history. Now, I read that and immediately thought, well, there's something wrong here. What's going on? But rather than explain that to you right away what's going on that's wrong here, I'm going to spend the rest of the podcast explaining and well I kind of gave it away when I told you what this is about he's uh, not making the appropriate distinctions or at least or that is excuse or that is excuse me he's failing to see certain distinctions that are in these types of things so I'll come back to that and explain more of that later so to get started here I'm going to tell uh, I'm going to tell a little story and give another example of how distinctions and definitions are so important so every night before we put her to bed, my wife and I will 
read a story to our daughter Ruth from a little like children's Bible. We've got two of them, and when we're done with one, we cycle through the other one, and then go back to the other one. Well, a few nights back, I was reading her the story of Zacchaeus and how Zacchaeus climbed the tree to see Christ, and then Christ said, I'm going to come to your house, and Zacchaeus repented of all his sins when Christ was at his house and made amends. And of course, the children's story told it in little children's languages, and there was colorful pictures of Zacchaeus up in the tree and things along those lines. Well, I have encouraged Ruth to ask me questions at the end of the story about whatever she wants to talk about that relates to the story. She used to interrupt me constantly when I was reading the story, and I didn't really like that, so instead, if I remember right, uh, Sarah, my wife, actually encouraged me to do this. She said, why don't you just tell Ruth she can ask you questions at the end of the story? So that's what we do. So this time, in the process of asking questions, Ruth was asking what Zacchaeus was doing, and I was explaining, well, he's repenting of his sins. He's saying he's not going to do wrong things. He's not going to do mean things to people anymore. And Ruth was like, well, why is he saying that? And Sarah chimed in and said, well, it's because when we do that kind of stuff, it makes God sad. Now... Ruth has also been watching other little children's educational videos like uh, Daniel Tiger and some other things like that, and a lesson that she gets from there is, well, it's okay to be sad. And since I'm an adult, and I'm sure at least most of the people listening to this are adults, we can always we can see the distinction there, that when Ruth's uh, children's shows or Daniel Tiger or whatever is telling her it's okay to be sad. They're saying it's okay if you feel upset that you didn't get to go out to play this today because it's raining or, or it's okay if you feel sad when mom goes to work or something along those lines. Whereas what Sarah meant when she was saying to Ruth, when we sin, it makes God sad. Well, that's something a bit different. It's, it's similar, but it's not the same thing at all. But Ruth has heard both of those things, and so she picked up on that and responded to my wife. But it's okay to be sad, i.e. she was trying to say, wait, wait, why is it bad if we make God sad? It's okay to be sad, so why is that bad? <laughs> and both Sarah, my wife and I laughed and tried to explain it to her a little bit more, and I was actually feeling rather proud of her because even though she's only four, what she's really picked up on there is the distinction that sad in the sense of when we sin it makes God sad, means something different than in the sense of it's okay for my daughter to be sad when it's raining and she can't go play outside because she wants to go play outside or something like that. And you can either explain that as saying there's a distinction there or you can say explain it as saying sad is defined in a different way in the sense of when we sin it makes God sad than in the sense of Ruth is sad because she can't go outside and play. But Ruth being four, she doesn't understand that distinction, that difference in definition yet, but as an, as adults we all do, and I shared that because I thought it was both funny and very illustrative. Now a second example of this is I'm going to get, play you a very, very, the audio of a very, very short sketch from the show Key and Peel that was on Comedy Central a while back. It was a fairly irreverent show that ran for about three years on Comedy Central where Keegan-Michael Key and Jordan Peel ran short comedy sketches, and some of them were pretty funny, some of them not so much. Um, it did get a little raunchy at times, so I'm only playing you one of, it's a like three-part sketch, I'm only playing you the middle one because the other ones have language that isn't appropriate here. But what they're doing here is essentially making fun of Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it's another example of where someone's drawing distinctions in a way that maybe, uh, just possibly, perhaps, they should not. Neil! There you are. What are you doing? We have to go to my Aunt Nellie's funeral. How were you not ready? I've been talking to you about this all week. How am I going to find you in your boxes looking at a science magazine? I swear, Neil, sometimes I think you don't have any idea of what's important. Well, actually, an idea of what's important is as close as we can ever come to any definition of importance. Our galaxy is one of over a hundred billion in the observable universe, and it's a hundred thousand light years across, which means it would take light a hundred thousand years to traverse. Okay, but, but that's just space. If we were to chart the history of the universe on one calendar year, the history of mankind as we know it would just take place in the final second of that year. So, whether I'm ready now, 
more than 500 years, well, cosmically speaking, the distinction is meaningless. Well, okay. I'm, I'm going now. Goodbye, honey. Okay, so I hope you found that as funny as I did. As I said, there they did three little short sketches of uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talking to his wife and essentially drawing very uh, inappropriate and irrelevant distinctions to get out of the kind of things that most couples fight about. Well, not most couples, at least not in one of them. But anyhow, I won't play the other two because the language is inappropriate for this podcast, even though they were pretty funny. But I hope you can see there that what they were making fun of is... In, at least in the sketch, Tyson is, is drawing all these distinctions that have literally nothing to do with what his wife is complaining about, but he's doing it in such a uh, smart-sounding way that his wife is like, well, I, I, I don't really know how to respond to that, I, and he just kind of gives up and goes away. Well, in one of the other sketches, she doesn't do that, but anyhow. Um, so that's an example of how distinctions are important, because there in the argument, he's drawing distinctions that have nothing to do with what's going on. And if his wife had been able to uh, recognize that a little better, then she probably could have argued back against him. Now, if you think about this in relation to humor in general, and I hope this doesn't ruin jokes for you, because typically speaking, explaining a joke kind of ruins it and takes the fun out of it. So, but oh well, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, a lot of jokes, and a lot of funny jokes, depend on people doing this thing. They're either drawing a distinction where they shouldn't in some way, saying these two things aren't alike even when they really are, or they're doing the reverse of that and saying these two things really are very much alike even though they're not, which is what Tyson was doing in that uh, sketch there. Or very often, in a lot of humor, what happens is two different people are working with two different definitions of the same word, and so they don't realize they're talking past each other. And I don't have a good example of that coming to mind, but usually when it's done in a honest way and nobody's doing that on purpose, that's funny. That's a good joke. When it's done dishonestly, where somebody's doing that on purpose, then it's disingenuous, that it's intellectually dishonest and possibly malicious, depending on how or why they're doing it. And so the reason why I wanted to talk about this is, as I said, being able to understand when and where it's appropriate to draw distinctions and how you do that and how you define things, how you define the words you're saying, the terms you're using, etc., etc., and how you categorize things, it's uh, pretty, pretty close to the very foundations of thought, which is, again, why I can't really believe I didn't do this as one of the very first podcasts, because... If you can get this kind of stuff right, then it's very, very, very low chance that you're going to make basic errors in thinking. I mean, maybe if you are working with highly, highly abstract uh, modal logic where you're thinking of the different senses of necessity, you might get a few things wrong there. But if you're working in your daily life as to how you evaluate arguments, how you figure out what people are claiming to you, how you understand what you're going to do in various real-world situations, you get those things right. You get how you categorize things, how you define things, and where to draw distinctions right. Yeah, you're probably going to be okay. So since I told you that funny little story about my daughter in the intro and played you a comedy sketch, now I'm going to read you some of the uh, more boring things about how Aristotle actually did draw these distinctions. So, here's what I've realized. In studying Aristotle, I've come to realize that one of the most important th things in reasoning well is, as I said, understanding how to appropriately draw distinctions and how to categorize things, and how to define things. I found in all my study of philosophy and reading politics and theology and many other things that most of all the errors that are not malicious, that is, when somebody's being honest and they're really, really trying, and yet they still make a mistake in reasoning, it's generally going to fall into these three categories. This person fails to draw appropriate and necessary distinctions, or they attempt to draw distinctions that are between things that are the same. That is, there's two things that really are the same, and the person attempts to draw an inappropriate distinction between them. Like, a easy example is, 
there's two uh, Toyota Camrys that literally just rolled off the assembly line and are as alike in every possible way that a car can be. In the absolute possible sense, they are two different cars, but they're as similar as two cars can be. So if somebody comes along and tries to say, well, this car is drastically different than this other one, eh, that's, that's inappropriate unless they have some good reason for that, like, I don't know, a, one of them was really, really damaged in the assembly process or something like that. And that's not the greatest of examples, because typically speaking, when someone draws an inappropriate distinction between things that are alike, it's a little bit more abstract, and I'll get into that a little later when I get into examples. And the third c category that these errors fall in is when somebody assigns something to the wrong category. That is, they usually this usually falls under defining the terms or the words they're using in a wrong way. They think something means something when it means something else, or, well, he's a easy example of this. We typically categorize animal species into things like fish, uh, reptiles, mammals, and so on and so forth. Well, it'd be a very big error if you said an iguana is a mammal. You've categorized it poorly. You've categorized it wrong. And people will often make categorical errors like that in other things. Like they'll start talking about epistemology, what you can know and what you're warranted to know, when they should be talking about the ontological basis for things, and vice versa. That's an error that happens all the time. So, the more and more I've uh, read and studied these things, and especially Aristotle, the more and more it seems to me that primarily what Aristotle was doing in his uh, philosophizing and his basis that he was laying down is he was just drawing out distinctions and categorizing things. Now, I don't say that that's all he's doing, because being able to do these two things successfully is really, really quite an achievement. I'm not trying to reduce things to that. But he spends so much time and effort categorizing things, pulling out the right distinctions, pushing away the wrong distinctions, that then when he does start building up his systems of thought, well, they're resting on very, very solid grounds. And, and I think this is one of the primary reasons why even Bertrand Russell called Aristotle Plato deluded by common sense. And it's often said of Aristotle that his most basic philosophical commitment was to common sense, because that is how you do common sense. You categorize things and you draw distinctions. And it's also for this reason that it's said that Aristotle created the most marvelous and influential system of thought that was ever put together by a single mind. Now, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but the mere fact that people say that of him shows how good this works. Now, Aristotle's so good at doing this type of thing that there are e even in cases where he makes mistakes, at least what I would think is a mistake, such as how, depending on how you read him, read Aristotle, there might be... 47 or more unmoved movers in his system, well, the mistakes he made are sensible, and it's easy to see how a reasonable person could have made the same mistakes given the same knowledge as Aristotle. That is, I think if you and I were sitting in Aristotle's shoes, had his system of thought in place, and had the knowledge he, he had, and we were doing our best to reason about it, we might well come up with the idea that there are 47 or more unmoved movers as well. Same thing with his idea of the definitions of time, which I've talked about on here before, that his definition is the very sensible, commonsensical thing, that time is a moment with a before and an after. And we now know that's wrong, but that's very, very sensible. It's very reasonable. And the fact that we now have good scientific knowledge that tells us the universe began to exist, well, Aristotle didn't have that, so there you go. And it's the same thing with a, he had a claim that um, an actual vacuum doesn't exist. So here are a couple of examples of how Aristotle did this categorization and distinction. The first one I'll talk about, and perhaps the most important distinction that he makes, is that knowledge is found in the object that is known, rather than in the mind of the knower. Quoting Aristotle, he said, Actual knowledge is identical with its object. Potential knowledge in the individual is in time prior to actual knowledge, for all things that come into being arise from what actually is. So the knowledge in my mind begins in my senses, not within my mind. That is, when I see things, I get that information from my eyes, and then it's in my mind, not the other way around. This basic epistemology, I think, is very key, as virtually everything else follows from that. Aristotle's solution to the problem of universals, which I talked about back in uh, podcast number, it was 42, uh, I talked about Aristotle toward the end of that one. Anyhow, his solution to the problem of universals doesn't work without this distinction. If the knowledge of universals begins in my senses and not in my mind, then there must be some actual basis for them in reality. 
Since Plato thought that our senses don't give us a very good picture of reality, that's kind of the point of his metaphor of the cave, then he was forced to conclude that universals are more real than our sense experience, but this seems to fly in the face of common sense. Conversely, the later nominalists, which is the, I think, I would say nominalism is probably the most popular position in philosophy nowadays, but it came very long after Plato. Anyhow, they've concluded that the object of the knowledge is in the mind, and so therefore conclude that the universals must be illusions or just words, as I talked about in the last podcast just about a month ago, which was all about the problem of universals. And as I'd said there, this nominalist position seems to contradict itself, as if there are no universals, then... How can the nominalists identify them to claim that they're not there? And that's kind of a, uh, maybe a little bit too superficial of a brush off, but if you want a better brush off, go back and listen to the last podcast episode. Well, anyhow, the point here is because Aristotle was able to start by drawing a distinction that the object of a thought is not always the same thing in the same sense as that thought, then he's able to take a middle road through this tangled epistemological mess. And Aristotle often seems to be finding the middle ways through commonsensical messes that other philosophers have a hard time finding their way through. And I would say that's mostly because he's very good at categorizing things and drawing distinctions. Another place where Aristotle does this that's key is in his four causes. And again, I talked about those back in podcast episode 42, if you want to go back and review. Well, these are examples of categorizing the way in which we consider and think about things and then drawing distinctions out of the idea of what a cause is. I think also important here is this understanding of four causes is really only possible if Aristotle's epistemology, or at least something very close to it, is right or accepted. Without the reality that knowledge begins in my senses, there is no way for me to really know if everything around me is actually caused by any cause, much less his four causes. So all of Aristotle's four causes, the material cause, the efficient cause, the formal cause, and the final cause, or teleological cause, they're all extremely important because all of them affect everything. An interesting side effect of, say, everything having a final or teleological cause is that chance, as it's typically spoken of and understood, becomes non-existent. If everything really does have a goal that it's moving towards or a purpose, then everything, in some sense at least, really does happen for a reason. It's just that things appear random and like chance in the world because much of the world is just too complicated for us to observe and understand all the different causes at work in everything because virtually everything has multiple causes working in relation to it at, all at once at the same time. And another key distinction that we get from Aristotle, although other philosophers have also talked about this, is the distinction between what's essential and what's accidental. Anything about me can change without changing who I am, so that's accidental. So I could lose parts of my body, change my habits, start liking and disliking different foods, and I'd still remain Phil, as those things are accidental to me. Now this solves many apparent problems that Aristotle's predecessors had, as many of them couldn't even understand how change is possible. If I'm remembering correctly, that was actually one of Zeno's uh, paradoxes, or it might have been related to one of Zeno's paradoxes, is how can things change? So, how is it that the Phil who's talking on this podcast right now is the same Phil who returned to the United States from being overseas for several years back in 2005? My matter has changed. We know from medical science that all the matter in a human body is cycled out about every seven years, so it's been far more that my matter has changed twice since then. How am I the same person? Hence, uh, Parmenides, oh yeah, it was Parmenides, uh, Zeno's paradoxes were different, pardon me. He and some others concluded that no change happens, and that everything really is one, and all change is in the loosen. Now, while this distinction between what's essential and accidental doesn't completely solve the problem, because we still need to appeal to some higher metaphysical concepts, like a primary substance of matter and form for that, it does help considerably, and cut Aristotle, again, a middle, commonsensical way through the problems of his predecessor. The obvious solution to this problem is that I, Phil can be the same Phil, I can be the same person as I was 15 years ago, because only the accidental properties have changed and the essential substance that makes me me has stayed the same. And the higher metaphysical problem is then identifying, well, what's the essential substance? But bracket that out for a second and you can easily see, oh, drawing this distinction between essential properties and accidental properties, it's easy to see how things can change and still remain themselves then.
Now, the final distinction that Aristotle makes that I'll mention here, and he talked about many, many other ones, is the distinction between potentiality and actuality. This is, again, another very, very key, I'd say, if not baseline, very close to baseline distinction, because when you're reading Aristotle, he doesn't really seem to worry about any distinctions that aren't pretty key and important. And it, again, explains and solves many things that were problems with his precedent, that his predecessors had. Actuality is simple as it simply is the things that actually do exist. If you want to get even into even more detail about that, go back to episode 70 where I talked a bit about the modal ontological argument or go back to about a year and a half ago when I talked to Ben Arbor about the ontological argument and I discuss in more detail as to what actuality is there. So the simple point there is actuality is just the things that actually exist, so everything that actually exists is actual. Now this does seem very simple enough, but many later philosophers like Descartes, Kant, and Hume had a very, very hard time grasping this basic principle. Now, potentiality is also, at least it should be, very simple as it's the ability of things to be moved or changed. And this, the definition of move that the Greek philosophers like Aristotle used is not the same thing as what we think of as moving. They included the idea of change within moving. So if you're sitting in a chair but you don't move location, but your body changes because you're breathing and things like that, they would think of that as movement or motion because they included change within the idea of moving within space. So Aristotle said, with regard to the potential, we need not only ascribe potency, that is potential, to that whose nature it is to move something else or to be moved by something else, but also use the word in another sense. So Aristotle makes a distinction between two different types of potentiality here. The first sense is the typical sense that like contemporary physics understands very well. A rock sitting on a hill has the potential to be pushed by something, either a person or earthquake or whatever, and then roll down the hill. It further has the potential to be changed as it could be smashed into smaller rocks when it hits the bottom of the hill or something like that, or a person could come along and smash it and change it that way. Now, the second potentiality that Aristotle works with is agent causation, and a lot of contemporary physics has a very, very big problem with this type of potentiality. That is, it, since it and loosely speaking, very, very loosely, the reason it has a problem with this is agent causation cannot be measured or understood in the same way as the first type of potentiality, and many modern physics just don't know what to do with it, so they end up either ignoring it or pretending they've explained it all away when they've absolutely done no such thing. So what is meant by uh, the agent causation, I don't think, and Aristotle wouldn't have really used that term, but it means more or less the same thing, What's meant by that is that most, if not all of life, that is people, animals, plants, other things that are living, well, it seems to have the ability to start moving and stop moving without something external coming in to push and pull it around. That is, I have the potential to do many things like eat, sleep, drive a car, drink some coffee, drink some scotch, whatever. Now, in some sense, when I do these things, I was enabled to do so by the potentiality that I could do those things. But this is not at all the same sense in which the rock was pushed so it could roll down the hill. The rock seems to need some external force to push upon it in order to do that, in order to exercise its potential to go down the hill. Where when you look at me and why I made and drank a cup of coffee this afternoon, well, it, it really doesn't seem, at least not on the face of it, not without getting very, very deep into things and very complicated, that something else pushed me to go do that. It seems like I just decided to go do that on my own. At least that's, again, what the very commonsensical notion is, is I had a cup of coffee because I wanted to do that. It's agent causation. Now, because a great deal of modern physics is very materialistic, it ends up denying agent causation, and then they also deny this distinction, and hence they wind up being forced into claiming crazy things like, I was determined to give this podcast in exactly this way from the very moment the universe came into being. At least that seems to be what follows from determinism. There is no possible way, no possible world, well, no, no, using possible world semantics doesn't work here. There's no possible way in which from the very beginning of the universe that I could have given a different podcast than I gave today. The content couldn't have been different. I couldn't have used any different words. I couldn't have even enunciated differently, and the various little mistakes I make when enunciating words improperly, most of which I actually edit out, well, 
they had to be exactly the same. That is, I had no choice, and all of this was predetermined determined from the very moment the first molecule started moving. Now, of course, this just flies in the face of common sense and humanity's collective experience, and Aristotle's words that, quote, what then causes this, that which was potentially to be actual, except in the case of things which are generated, the agent. So it's at points like this, this strong claim of determinism, which tends to follow from what some modern scientists say, although they are, it, some of them don't like to admit it, but it does, that they start sounding an awful lot like Aristotle's predecessors of Parmenides and Zeno, who postulated claims that like denied humanity's collective experiences and common senses. Fortunately, Aristotle's simple but brilliant distinctions, categories, and definitions enabled him to find and preserve the medical and commonsensical way. So, when you're reading modern Zenos who claim that they were determined to write their own words, i.e. Sam Harris, and write psychological essays denying the existence of themselves or claim that no one can understand what anyone actually means, that's post some postmodern literary critics, Aristotle's simple, brilliant, and wonderful categories and distinctions still point toward the middle and commonsensical way. Most of his distinctions are very simple, but they're very key to understanding and addressing many of the problems that we have now, just as they were when he uh, discovered them, stumbled across, across them, whatever terminology you want to use there. So now you might be thinking something like, well, hooray, Phil, good for you. You read Aristotle. What, what does that have to do with anything else that's going on in our world? How, do, how is this relevant? Well, it's actually very, very relevant. As I'm recording this, there's a number of different crises going on in the world and in America. And a lot of people seem to be completely unable to think about them in any real or reasonable sense. And if they could just understand how distinctions are made and how to define things and how many of them are defining things very, very differently, that would help a lot of us to discuss and talk about these things in much more reasonable senses. So easy example is that a lot of political leaders are completely unable to make any kind of distinctions or proper categorizations with regard to the coronavirus and COVID-19. Well, same thing, but if you listen to the media talk, they right now they kind of seem to have forgotten about this crisis but it is still ongoing and the example of this is a couple of uh, weeks it might even be a month or two ago so the uh, governor of uh, new york andrew cuomo was talking about this about uh in regards to the coronavirus and he made the statement that all of human life is precious in regards to the virus and so he was going to do everything he could to the implication at least was he was going to do everything he could to save people from the virus well see that sounds good but the reality is that was he was kind of making a political statement there against people who were saying, well, we want to go back to work. As everybody who's been following this knows, that's where the sides kind of lined up, is people saying, we want to go back to work, and other people saying, no, stay home, you're going to get yourselves killed or get other people killed. And it is the case, for that, at least from a Christian theistic perspective, that every human life is precious. Every human life has infinite value that can't really be calculated and compared in numbers. At least that's certainly what I think. But there's a distinction here that Cuomo was deliberately glossing over or not making, which is when it comes to how the government acts, that is public policy, you actually have to make decisions about how valuable human life is all the time. That's essentially the government's job when it comes to policy. Uh, if you genuinely had wanted the government to act like every human life is absolutely precious, then the government would have to ban everything that anyone ever could die from. People die in car accidents all the time. I don't want the government to ban car travel. It's very, very good and it enables a lot of good things in our lives, even though people die from it. And that's what public policy, what the government policy is supposed to do, is find a way to balance that. Like, at a certain point, it would seem to be the case that too many people are dying in car accidents, so we need to change something. We need to make the cars safer. We need to stop people from driving or something along those lines. If every third or every second plane that flew crashed, well, I think we should stop people from flying. But at the current rate at which planes crash, it's probably reasonably safe, even though some people do die in plane crashes, but it's remarkably rare. Conversely, with cars, you're far more likely to die of a car crash than a plane crash, even if you fly all the time. 
So the point is, Cuomo was deliberately glossing over the fact that it is his job as the governor of New York to come up with policies that make that distinction, that try to say, how are we going to balance all these competing interests? And he was glossing over that. In his case, I'm not sure if he was being disingenuous or if he was just completely unable to realize that. Another example, and this one isn't quite as serious in the sense that it's not like killing people or going to destroy their lives or something, but I found that when I'm talking to young earth creationists, they seem to be unable to make a distinction between literal and figurative or metaphorical languages. They still kind of do that in an offhanded way, as many people who I've talked to do. I think Michael Jones made the point when I was talking to him that when you read Noah's flood story and it says, and the windows of heaven were opened, nobody thinks that there were literal windows because that's clearly a metaphor. But try to bring up the idea that maybe the first couple, first chapter of Genesis could be figurative or metaphorical languages, and they balk at that. They are unable to under, to make that distinction. Now, to be fair, in some cases, it's not that they're unable to recognize there's a distinction there. They just simply reject that distinction. And that's, that's fair and that's reasonable, and we can have arguments and discussions about that, which I've tried to do on here. But so I brought that up mostly just to illustrate there's another case where there's a distinction where I would want to look at the first chapter of Genesis and say, yeah, there's probably some figurative and metaphorical language going on here and distinguish that from straightforward history that a contemporary historian would write about, say, World War II or ancient Egypt or something. And you're at most young earth creationists would reject that distinction because they're either unable to make it or they do understand what I'm trying to do and say, no, I don't think that's an appropriate distinction, in which case we've got a disagreement about what the appropriate distinction is and we need to do our best to hash that out. Another example of this uh, distinction is it seemed to me back when I did that debate with David Van Beber on inerrancy, and I realize I'm plugging my own podcast quite a bit in this podcast, but hey, it works. That's ep that's episode 58 and then 59 where I went back and talked about it. Well, it seemed to me he was very, he was unable to distinguish between the fact of our knowledge and the reasons or foundations for our knowledge, or more philosophically speaking, he was unable to distinguish between epistemology how we know things, how are, we're warranted in believing things, and ontology, why we even know anything at all, why there is such a thing as knowledge. Because he kept appealing to God as the reason he knows things, and in the sense of ontology, in the sense of why there is knowledge, in the sense of why there is anything, that's correct. But epistemologically speaking, that's wrong, unless it's like God literally told you something. If uh, you're a prophet and God comes and tells you something, well then that's epistemologically the case is God's why you know things. But for those of us who God doesn't speak to directly all the time like that, well then it's inappropriate to appeal to God because you're not making that appropriate distinction between why you're justified in knowing things and where knowledge comes from, what's its foundation. And since that debate ended, I know I've mentioned this before, and I do intend to do it at some point, I intend to do a whole podcast on the method of a thinking slash apologetics, although I wouldn't really call it thinking, that David uh, comes from called presuppositional apologetics, and it deliberately denies that very important distinction. And so, again, I'm citing that as an example of there. there's a place where not making that distinction has some key consequences for what you believe. And I would hope people who are in agreement with presuppositionalism there would at least say, well, yeah, that's a, you're making a distinction there that we reject. And so at least in that case, it could function as another example of, well, here's why it's important to understand when you do and don't make distinctions. So carrying this on, it's now been a couple of weeks since the news came out that this uh, guy, black guy in Georgia was killed by people who were possibly acting in a vigilante fashion. The, the details on that aren't really clear. The facts haven't come out, but there's a video of that going around and it, the guy gets shot and it looks like there are people acting in a vigilante fashion. Well, I listened to some lawyers talking about that and apparently in Georgia, it's entirely possible what those guys were doing was legal because in Georgia, people have the ability to make citizens arrests to a much larger degree than they do in other states. And so a lot of people who are talking about this online, they're failing to see the distinction between what's legal and what's moral. That is, 
it's perfectly reasonable, and I think probably good and right, for you to say, well, it's it's possible what these guys did is actually legal under Georgia law, but it's still immoral, it's still unethical, it's still wrong, therefore the law should be changed. And people who are pro-life like me should easily be able to make this distinction, because it's perfectly legal in many circumstances and cases to get an abortion in this country right now. But I, I'd argue 99.999% of the time, it's extremely immoral and unethical, and it's just murder. Well, the law is saying something's right that I'm saying morally is wrong. And you could do the reverse of that with this guy who got killed in Georgia and say, well, the law says what they did more or less okay legally speaking. But I'm saying maybe the law says that. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I listen to some lawyers who are experts say, yeah, there's, there's a case that could be made that what they did is legal. They had the right to make a citizen's arrest under Georgia law. But I would say, well, even if that is the case, I still want to say that's immoral and wrong, and that means there's something wrong with the Georgia law and it should be changed or amended. But a lot of people were are just simply unable to even un understand or grasp this concept. They are started viewing the law as identical to morality, which it clearly, clearly is not. The law often has a lot to do with what's practical and what you can do, what you can get away with in a society, versus as opposed to what's moral. There's a, There are cases where what's legal and what's moral is this more or less the same, but not always. Okay, so my warning that people might interrupt me was right. I had to get up and take my kids to VBS, and this is now the next day, so the sound levels may have changed. My apologies for that. Anyhow, moving you know, on, another example. Uh, Chris Cuomo, who's a reporter for CNN, was recently talking about the protests that are going on, and more or less saying, hey, it's okay that they're not peaceful because look at American history. So here's a clip of him doing that. Too many see the protests as the problem. No, the problem is what forced your fellow citizens to take to the streets. Persistent and poisonous inequities and injustice. And please, show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. Because I can show you that outraged citizens are the ones who have made America what she is and led to any major milestones. Be honest, this is not a tranquil time. Now, what I would want to say here is that Cuomo's failing to make and see some very, very key distinctions between American history as far as protests and ang angry, dissatisfied people making that happen and what's going on now. For example, uh, pe uh, Cuomo didn't do this, but I've seen some people online attempting to compare the protests that have been going on for the past week or two to, say, the Boston Tea Party. Well, in the case of the Boston Tea Party, the people who did that were very, very selective in their approach. They only went after tea from one particular company, which had a monopoly, the monopoly of which was enabled by the British government at the time. They didn't randomly attack people and loot things, which is more or less what it seems like is going on now, at least many of the places. So that seems like a pretty big distinction. Secondly, there have been many, many cases where there have been violent protests in the country, look at back in the 60s, but historically speaking, it looks like very fairly often you get the opposite result of what people wanted. For example, back in the 1968 election, there were lots and lots of protests going on in the country and lots of protests around uh, the Democratic Convention at that time, and many historians now look back and think that's part of the reason Richard Nixon actually got elected in 68 is because most of the people who are the moderate fence sitters, the people who are kind of in the middle, looked at all the protests and said, we don't want to enable that. So what Cuomo is doing there is he's failing to draw distinctions that I would want to argue he should be making. He's trying to equate the current protests where there's lots of looting and property destruction and people attacking cops to what was going on back in the 60s. And other people have been doing it back, equate it, trying to equate it back to the American Revolution, when there's actually a lot of very, very big differences between them. And so it's probably inappropriate to equate them like that. In the same vein, there's now because of all this that's going on, there's a lot of talk of so-called unconscious biases or how you may, uh, there may be systematic discrimination against people, but that's not like at the uh, level where you actively choose to suppress this minority in favor of this majority or something along those lines. 
So I hear that talk, and I'm fairly skeptical of a great deal of it for a whole host of data-driven reasons that don't really relate to what I'm trying to do in this podcast. But is it appropriate, I would say, to make a distinction between these ideas of uh, unconscious biases or the idea that you're racist if you want to live by people who look mostly like you? Well, is there a distinction between a type of racism that's like that and between something like the KKK that going out and lynching and murdering in black people just because they're black? Well, see, I would want to say absolutely yes, because at the very least, there's a moral distinction there. Even if you're going to say both are moral wrongs, one is clearly much, much worse. It's also the case that it's much easier to identify that one of those is going on. Unconscious biases are, are but given the nature of the claim, by their nature, they would be very, very hard to identify and figure out. And it's very similar with talk about other related matters, like, say, white privilege. I think I talked about that on a podcast episode a long, long time ago, suggesting that most of the time when people use that term, it's really just a conversation stopper. It's not an invitation to explore the topic deeper. It's essentially to say, you have no right to speak on this because of your privilege. And that's a wrong thing entirely. But in a different vein, let's say that even if I give you give the person who wants to talk about unconscious biases and white privileges, suppose I just, for the sake of argument, give them all of that. Well, I would then say, for the most part, it seems like, at least the way it comes across is, they're still not drawing an appropriate distinction between people like the cop who murdered George, George Floyd and other people who simply just want to live around people who look like them. Now, as I said, you can make an argument that it's still bad or immoral if someone wants to only live around people of their own ethnicity. And, but, but statistically speaking, you can actually prove that that's the case with most people. But even if you do want to say that that's immoral, it's in no way comparable to things like what the cop did to George Floyd or instances of ethnic, ethnic cleansing and genocide and things along those lines. So if you are someone who does buy into and think that there is some problems with unconscious biases against minorities and things like white privilege, well, then this is a distinction you need to make and you need to do a better job of making it clear to people that you are making this distinction because what actually happens here is most of the time when academics or other people start talking about things like white privilege and unconscious biases and say you have to people, you have racist thoughts, most people think I, I haven't, I'm not even joined the KKK. I don't go around killing people. I haven't discriminated against a black person just because he's a black person. Therefore, I'm not racist. Therefore, what you're saying is crazy. However, if I take these claims that people are making at face value, white privilege and unconscious biases, etc., they're not at all the same thing. But the people who are making those claims don't make that distinction clear and hence the conversation doesn't get anywhere. So the problem is that most of the time when someone talks of, say, systematic racism, white privilege, or unconscious bias, what people who aren't already in that type of thinking hear is that they're being told they're like something like the KKK, or they're just as guilty as the Germans who stood by and let the Nazis kill Jews and other minorities. And that's obviously not true, hence they just dismiss it out of hand. So what needs to happen there is have a more nuanced discussion about it where you make this distinction. Now, moving on from distinctions to definitions, here is a clip of uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. She's a reporter who started the uh, something that's called the 1619 Project, which essentially tries to focus on slavery in America and takes a very, uh, what many people have called, anti-American view, although I haven't actually read any of this. I have too many other things to do than go read everything that comes out. So she's talking about all the stuff that's going on here. It is disturbing to see property being destroyed. It is disturbing to see uh, people taking property from stores. But these are things. And violence is when an agent of the state kneels on a man's neck until all of the life is leached out of his body. Destroying property which can be replaced is not violence. And to put those things, uh, to use the exact same language to describe those two things, I think really um, it's, not, it's not moral to do that. Okay, so I'm sure you heard there that she's actually attempting to make a distinction between, at least it seems, if you want to interpret her very, very charitably, different types of violence. And 
if you take the best possible interpretation of what she's saying, she's saying, hey, violence in where you're destroying property is not as bad as an agent of the state killing a person. And I would say that's absolutely true. That's very similar to what I've claimed a couple of times here before, that there's gradations of morality where you go wrong, and it's more wrong for an agent of the state to kill someone than it is for there to be property destruction. Yeah, I, 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 I buy into that. That makes perfect sense. However, she also explicitly defines violence in there when she says, this is what violence is, this is what violence is not. And there what she's actually done is given a very, very bad definition. Violence isn't just when an agent of the state kills someone. Violence would be if I hit somebody and even if it was justified, that's still violence. Violence is when a man who has no connection with the state hits his wife. Violence is when somebody who is, again, has no connection with the state takes up a gun and goes and shoots somebody, even if it's justified because, say, that other person was breaking into the first person's home, or many, many other things like that. And yes, in most traditional definitions of it, violence does include property damage. In this case, given the other writing and activism that Nicole Hannah-Jones has uh, participated in and advocated for, it seems to me she's giving a very disingenuous definition of violence here, because I strongly, strongly suspect that if the colors and ethnicities of the people doing the violence were reversed and say it was a bunch of white people going around destroying businesses that were owned by black people and other minorities, she'd cry racist violence. And I'd be inclined to agree that that would be racist violence. But here, she's giving a bad definition of violence in order to try to support the uh, political ideals and ideology that she holds. And things like that happen fairly often, especially if you're a very, very clever person. One of the easiest ways to get out of conclusions and uh, problems that you don't like is just to redefine things in your own terms that recast everything, which is what Nicole Hannah-Jones did there. Because violence isn't just when an agent of the state kills someone. Violence is all these other things, and yeah, that includes property damage, especially when you're dealing with a lot of property damage. And furthermore, it isn't like in these riots, it's just property damage. Many of the looters and rioters are actually physically attacking cops and trying to kill them. So there you go, person-on-person -person violence. Now, I think I've mentioned this in podcasts before, but I don't know if I've ever explicitly defined it. But when you're being disingenuous, that comes from giving bad definitions, but you can give a bad definition and not be disingenuous. You could just be misinformed and have a bad idea of what that thing is. People, all of us are wrong about various things all the time, and sometimes we're wrong in how we define things. And sometimes two people acting in very, very good faith and trying to be reasonable can actually define things in very different ways. Uh, easy example that comes to mind is when I did this that whole series on the problem of divine foreknowledge, uh, the first guest I had on, Tim Carter, well, he defined free will very, very differently than I did. Now, Tim wasn't being dis disingenuous and he wasn't being dishonest. We have a substantive disagreement about what free will is. He defines it a different way than I do, and that's the argument we need to have. When you're disingenuous, it's when you deliberately use a bad definition or deliberately use two definitions and then pretend that you're not using two definitions. And again, as I mentioned before, sometimes people do that for the sake of humor where, yeah, they're being disingenuous, but they're doing it to, say, make a joke or something along those lines. Uh, uh, an example that I saw recently, which I actually didn't think was very funny, is the show Rick and Morty, which I generally speaking like, had a rather weird episode where the two characters were on something that's called a story train, where they were like affecting the story around them, and they were going to lose. And at the end of it, the uh, Rick character, who's a scientist, who's a pretty obnoxious, egotistical atheist, got down on his knees and started praying to Jesus to come save him, and his uh, nephew, excuse me, not nephew, grandson Morty is the guy who goes on adventures with him, and he started doing the same thing, and Jesus came out of the sky and saved them and ended the episode, and that was that. And so as they were walking away, Morty said, "Don't you, aren't you worried that people might find this offensive? And Rick said, how could people possibly find this offensive? We literally had Jesus Christ come and save us. And in one sense, I know they were trying to make a joke there. And I can see the attempted humor, although I didn't find it funny. And because they're being disingenuous, it isn't that fact that 
Jesus came out of the heavens to save them that people would find offensive. It's the, it's the fact that this character who in no way believes in God and is in many senses antithetical to pretty much everything Christ taught suddenly appeals to God to save him and that happens. So as they're walking away, Rick is being disingenuous about the whole thing. And honestly, I thought that that was like the worst episode of the show I'd ever seen. It just wasn't very funny in addition to making an offensive joke like that. Now, another example of this that's going on is it happened in the last week or so that President Trump uh, went and stood in front of the burned out church and was holding a Bible. And many people said, well, he shouldn't be doing that. And some other people uh, posted pictures of, say, Bill Clinton when he was president walking away from a church holding up a Bible. And there, I would say, the disingenuousness is kind of the other way, because the context is so radically different between Trump going and holding up a Bible and President Clinton going and holding up a Bible. Now, I don't have very good opinions of the morality of either of these, those men, but President Clinton was actually attending church, and I think my understanding is when that picture was taken, he was leaving the Sunday services and going back to the White House. President Trump literally did that just for a photo op. So to compare the two things is to be disingenuous. They're not the same thing. There's a distinction you need to draw there that a lot of people are deliberately failing to draw for the political reasons that they think they have to support President Trump by saying everything he does is good. Now, I heard Peter Kreft say something about this one time where he said that it's really only the very, very clever people who can be deceptively disingenuous. It's somebody who's a simple-minded and not very well-educated. Well, you're, they have a much harder time hiding the truth from themselves. But the smarter you are, the easier it is for you to find ways to hide from and avoid the truth you don't like, and very often being disingenuous is one of them. So, going back to the start of the podcast, that tweet by Rain Wilson. What's the problem here? Well, the problem here is that when you read the words of Christ in the Gospels and what other New Testament authors have to say about early Christianity, which I don't know if he's done or not, um, they seem to make a distinction that he is failing to make. That is, I th if you go read Christ, he has very, very little to say about politics and political theory. There's that one section, verse, little story where he says, render unto Caesar what Caesar's. There's a few other small places. There's some points where uh, Paul essentially says, submit to the authorities above you. But read the entirety of the New Testament looking for political theory and it telling you what you kind of government should be above you and what you should do about that. That's pretty much all you're going to find, and that's, that's not much. In fact, compare that to other political, philosophical, and religious leaders. They all have tons of stuff to say about politics. They all say explicitly... This is what, the way we think humankind's government should be organized. Uh, Plato's Republic is a great example of that, as you could easily read all of that as political philosophy. So why is it that Christ has almost nothing to say about this topic, which seems so incredibly important to so many human beings? How do we organize our societies? Well, I think it's because he's drawing a distinction. Now, he's not drawing it explicitly. But I think you can say he's implicitly drawing this distinction there to say, politics is not really that important. I want you to be a good, virtuous person who seeks after God, who repents and seeks God in his kingdom. And politics is very, very secondary at best to that. I think what Christ would say is, if you're seeking after me and you're seeking after God, you're striving to do, be a virtuous person, then whatever you think about politics, eh, not so important. It's going to flow in some senses from that, and that's fine. But you don't start with politics. You start with seeking in God and being a virtuous person. So, now think about Rain Wilson's tweet in regards to that. How is it that Jesus went from a humble servant of the poor to a symbol that stands for gun rights, prosperity, theology, and etc., 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 and limited government? Well, it's because Christ said almost nothing about politics, so people who are reading him in somewhat disingenuous manners can go on and insert all the politics they want to on Christ, because he said almost nothing about it. So that's a really easy distinction to make, and it seems to me Rain Wilson is failing to see that distinction that Christ makes, and maybe he's just unfamiliar with what Christ says in the Gospels, I, I have no idea. 
But that really answers it. You're going to see people who are on all sides of the political spectrum appealing to Christ, primarily because Christ did not explicitly spell out, hey, you need to be a Republican, hey, you need to be a Democrat, hey, you should support democracy, hey, you should support a constitutional monarchy, etc., etc., etc. He said virtually nothing about it. So this has gone on a bit too long, um, and that's my podcast for this week. This is why definitions, distinctions, and categories are so, so important. You get them wrong um, from the get-go, and you're almost certainly going to have a very, very hard time getting anything right. So I wish people who were running things in this country, the politicians especially, would do a better job of understanding how you think with distinctions, categories, and definitions, because it's very clear most of them have no clue how to do that, and that's why many of them wind up talking past each other and saying very, very stupid things, because they just don't have any clue as that's what's going on, and that's where I think a lot of these problems start, at least at an intellectual level. Morally speaking, there's probably a whole lot of other things going on. So, write in and let me know what you think. You can always reach me for comment of any kind at the Examine Life with Phil at gmail.com or look at the Facebook group I started for the podcast, The Examine Life with Phil. You can just do a search for that and find that. I always appreciate when people write in. I am committed to putting out another podcast in two weeks. And again, my apologies for the delay in getting this one done. There's nobody to blame for that but me, so my apologies. I'm not entirely sure what I'll be doing next time in two weeks. I've had a request or two to do a certain type of episode, and I've got a couple other things in the works, but I'll be back again in two weeks. Thanks for listening. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece, and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.